You may be seated tonight. You know, as, as we get started, I just want to have a little bit of, little bit of fun tonight. Um, do we, anybody in this place would, would consider yourself to be a, a, a water connoisseur? Going to use maybe a little nicer word there, commonly known as like a water snob, right? Now, I, I'm personally a, a coffee snob. Like, you give me a cup of coffee and I, I know what kind of coffee it is. Like, don't, be give me none, don't give me none of that Folger stuff. Like, that, that ain't coffee. You know, but, but, you know, my wife, God bless her, God has blessed her with an acute taste of water. She, she can tell if, if you give her a, a, a bottle of Dasani versus, they say, a bottle of Smart Water or Fiji Water, it's her favorite. She can, she can tell what it is just, just by the taste of the water, right? And I know some of you here probably like that. I Me, mean, all I care about is that it's wet, right? All I care about is that it works. It quenches my thirst water is water is water in, in, in my opinion however there was there was a time where where I was very particular about the temperature of my water all right now I know you guys are looking at me weird like I was one of those kind of guys that's like I want my water 72.5 degrees Fahrenheit like that that wasn't me but but no joke I'd literally walk into 7-eleven and I'd be like do you have room temperature water and the the lady behind the counter would be like wait what it's like we put it in the fridge for a reason. Like, people drink cold water. Like, no, do you have room temperature water? Now, I know that that sounds snobbish. But those of you that sing, try singing after drinking cold water. It doesn't work. There, there was one time, you know, I'd, I'd sing, in my, sing in my lungs out, leading worship. And God bless this usher, man of God, brought me some water because I was thirsty and I needed it. And I tanked it. The problem was it was cold. Choked me up. I think I hurt my vocal cords. It's, it's, it's crazy how that works. So I, I, I would go and I'd say, do you, have, do you have room temperature water? Because that, that was important to me at that time. Now what's interesting is that in this verse, Jesus comes to the church of Laodicea. He, he, he speaks through, through John. And he says, write this to the church that you're lukewarm. You're like lukewarm water. Now to us, warm water, cold water, Dasani, Aquafina, like it's water. It's the same thing. But there's something unique about this, this city that Jesus was writing to. One of, one of the unique things about the city of Laodicea is that surrounding the city, there were, there were two other cities that both had natural springs of water. One was the city of Hierapolis, the other was Colossae. Now Hierapolis had mineral hot springs that were renowned for their healing properties. People would come from, from around the known world to bathe in these, these hot water springs. The water at Colossae was cool and refreshing. In the t- city of Laodicea, they would, they would pipe in their water on aqueducts. They were dependent upon water from, from outside sources. Problem was that by the time the, the mineral hot springs, by the time that water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. But it was still, there, it was still full of minerals and it had, I would imagine, like a metallic taste to it. It was repulsive. It was repulsive. By the time it got to them, I almost liken it to, I don't know if you've ever, you ever been to the beach and you know, you, you're, you're dying of thirst and you forgot to bring water, but then you look in your car and you find a bottle of water that's been sitting there for two weeks and because you don't have any other option, you drink it and it just tastes disgusting because you're dying of thirst, you force yourself to drink it. If you're thirsty enough, if you're not, I mean, there's been times where it's thirsty. I was, I ain't, I'm not drinking this. I almost imagine that it was like that. By the time this, this, this water got to them, they didn't want anything to do with it. It was nauseating. It was repulsive. Jesus said, that's what you're like. Because the water is lukewarm. Something I don't want to have anything to do with. I want to read this verse one more time with that in mind. He said, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot, so that because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, funny story. Anybody either have a kid or was a kid at one point in your life that you just would blurt out the answers to everything? Like the whole raise your hand, wait to be called on, like that just wasn't you? That, you know, that was me. And I'm probably still kind of like that, but God's helping me. I'm, I'm getting better. Learning how to color inside the lines. It's awesome. But I remember I was sitting in church. I was probably about five years old. And the, the pastor... He was, he was preaching out of the same text and he said, does God want us to be hot? Does God want us to be cold? Or does God want us to be lukewarm? 
I imagine he was speaking rhetorically. He probably didn't expect anyone to answer him. But as, as a young five-year-old, I'm sitting there, and I'm just, I'm just thinking logically, well, hot water, like, ouch, that hurts. Like, I don't want that. Cold water, I don't like that either. It's burr. But, but lukewarm is just right. Just like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And then to top of it all off, Luke was a guy in the Bible. So I was like, obviously, this is it. So I, with all confidence, I shouted out, Luke Ward, in the middle of the church. And I was like, Andrew, quit. Pretty sure I embarrassed him. He probably turned red or something. I don't know. But, but it, contrary to what I thought at five years old, Jesus does not want a lukewarm church. Jesus does not want a lukewarm Christian. So I want to ask yourselves this question today is, is what, what does that even mean? What does it mean to be hot? What does it mean to be cold? What does it mean to be lukewarm? Well, I think the first two are quite easy to answer. A Christian that we would consider hot or on fire is someone that is just that. They're, they're passionate about the Lord. They love Jesus with all their heart. They love being in the house of God. They love reading the word. They're, they're, they're on fire for Jesus. They love him with every fiber of their being. A cold person would be somebody that's the exact opposite. They're indifferent to the things of God. You know, God's not really their thing. They don't really care about church. They, they're, just, they're just worldly. And lukewarm would be anything that's in the middle. Now, this is a scary thought. Because I would be lying to you if I told you that every morning, Pastor Andrew wakes up and he is on fire for the Lord. I'm just being honest. Maybe, maybe you're like that. If that's you, please come take the microphone. Right? You have more rights to preach than I do. There's some mornings I wake up and I'm like, yes, I want to pray. There's other mornings I wake up, especially after a late night, and I'm like, Jesus, I really want to sleep. Right? I really want to, I want, I really want to be doing something else right now. I'd rather, you know, get a couple extra Z's than spend some time praying or spend some time reading the Bible. It's, just, it's real, right? We all experience that. You know, we're not all 100% on fire every day of our life. You know, and, and, and even if you, were to, if you were to ask anyone on the street even, like, you know, would, would you prefer to, to be passionate and, 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 and successful? Or would you prefer to be mediocre? Every single person you would talk to, if they're in their right mind, would tell you that they want to be successful, that they want to be passionate, that they, they want to succeed, that they want to excel, that they want to be better than they are today. Nobody strives for mediocrity. As a believer, no one strives to be so-so and in the middle with their relationship with the Lord. Nobody makes that their goal, to be lukewarm. However, without intentionality, without, without an attitude that, God, I, I desire to be passionate for you, I desire to be on fire for you. If we don't make it a point to be on fire for the Lord, lukewarmness, mediocrity is just kind of what happens. It's just kind of the, the, the natural gravitational pull of our life. It's towards this place of mediocrity where, yeah, we still love God. We still claim the name of Christ. We're still a Christian. We're still saved, but, but we're not in love with Jesus. We're not on fire for the Lord. We're, we're not zealots for the things of God. And now the, the next question that needs to be asked is, is how in the world does, does that happen? How did, this, how did the church of Laodicea become lukewarm in the first place? What, what was the issue that they struggled with? But one of the things that's very interesting about the, the city of Laodicea is that they were one of the most affluent, one of the most wealthy cities of the ancient world. In fact, they, they were so well off that in 60 AD, they were destroyed by an earthquake and they're able to rebuild themselves without aid from the Roman Empire. They actually refused it. They said, we don't want it. We can, we can, we're self-sufficient. We can handle this ourselves. And, and it was a notable thing in history that, that the city was destroyed but they were wealthy enough, that they were self-sufficient enough to rebuild themselves. You know, as Americans, we pride ourselves in self-sufficiency. I think anyone living in the 21st century, that's, that's, that's something that we strive for. You know, it's not bad. I, I, I don't think God wants us to be dependent upon other people. But there, we have this, one of the goals of our modern life is, is to be self-sufficient, to not need anybody. You know, and if we're not careful, we can come to a place where we feel like we don't even need God. Now, there, there's a lot of parallels between the church of Laodicea and between the modern church today. In fact, there's even some theologians that believe that every one of these seven churches that John is writing to represents an era of church history. And within that school of thought, the church of Laodicea speaks of the modern day church, the church right before the rapture, which falls into complacency, 
which, which has veered into mediocrity, which has is, which is fallen out of, of passionate pursuit of the Lord. We have the same problem that they have. We live in a very affluent society. Now, you might be sitting here and be like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not on the top 1%. You know, I'm not, I'm not uber rich. I'm not incredibly wealthy. But I want you to think about it. Maybe you are. Did you know that to be in the top 1% globally, speaking of, of yearly income, all you have to make is $32,400 a year. That puts you in the top 1% from a global perspective. Now that, that changes our, our idea a little bit. We live in, we live in a day and age when, when so many of us, when so many people are in the top 1% of global income. If, if you were to take the top 10%, I'm sure everyone probably in the state would be higher than the, than the global average. We're a very affluent people, and the problem is this, and I want to make a statement tonight, that self-sufficiency has the potential to breed spiritual complacency. That when we're self-sufficient, that when we feel like we don't need anybody else, it can bring us to a place of spiritual complacency. What do I mean by that? I'll, I'll just give you examples from my own life. I, I am not very happy to admit this, but I, the times that I've been closest to the Lord have been the times when I've been in need. Whether it be financially, maybe I need God to come through for me in an area of ministry, or, or maybe I need God to come through for me in an area of my family. When I'm in need, that's when I seek God the most. How many of you would say that you might be able to relate with me on that? Times when maybe my bank account is not quite the numbers that I want to see. And I got some bills coming up. They're like, oh, Jesus, help me. And I start seeking God. Fall on my face, right? And, and actually, I've noticed that in those times, I actually get very close to the Lord. However, in those times where I have all the money I need, I'm good, I'm set, everything's looking, looking G, you can forget to seek the Lord. We can come into this place of self-sufficiency. We can come to this place of complacency where, where, yeah, we pray, but it's more like out of religious duty versus, God, I need you. And a lot of times we forget how much we need the Lord. And what I believe can happen in, in, when, that, when that begins to take place in our life is that we can come to, to almost a place of spiritual numbness. When there's no feeling and, and sensitivity. How many of you have experienced that before? You know, maybe it's because of complacency, maybe it's because of unforgiveness, maybe it's because of sin, maybe it's because of neglect. Whatever it is where it's like you don't really feel God anymore. The problem with that is when something, when you feel something, like, even if it's a negative feeling like pain, you're quick to want to do something about it. But when you're numb, when it's like someone gave you a spiritual Novocaine shot, it can be very easy to kind of drift off to this place where you don't really even notice that anything's wrong. You don't really even notice that you become complacent. You don't really even notice that there's something wrong. You don't even see the disconnect with your relationship with the Lord. And deception can set in. And that's what Paul was, it was uh, John, excuse me, was saying to this church. He's saying, you say that you're wealthy, you say that you have everything you need, but you don't know that you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, blind, and naked. What a list of negative attributes. I mean, how, how, how negative can you get where these people thought they had it all, these people thought they had it made? But Jesus is saying to them, you're completely deceived. You become complacent. You're lacking in your relationship with me. So how do we fix that in our life? What was, what was Jesus' antidote to spiritual complacency for this church? Well, I find it very interesting. He said to them, he said, I counsel to you, buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Notice that the cure to complacency is buy-in. The cure to complacency is to buy in completely. Or when it comes to your Christian walk, say, God, I'm all in. You ever realize that something purchased has value? You know, as much as I like receiving gifts, that there can be a danger that when somebody gives something to you, you don't treat it with the same amount of care and honor and, and almost respect that you would have something that you had to earn yourself. It's just a fact of life. You know, when you have to work hard to earn something, when you, when you, even when you set a goal, and, and every time you see that object that you set a goal and you worked hard to get to, you see all the hours you put into it. Maybe you're saving up for a car, saving up for a house, saving up for anything else. You finally get it, you finally move in, boy, do you appreciate it. 
It even applies to relationships. You know, you, you, you invest in a relationship, especially like if you're in the dating scene and, and you're, you're, just, you're just doing everything you can to try to impress this girl or try to impress this guy or try to win somebody's heart. Man, I tell you what, you value that. However, when you begin to, to forget the cost of something, when you, forget, when you begin to forget the, the price tag on something and, and how much it's worth, we can easily become complacent. So Jesus says, I want you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now I'm going to make a statement that might be startling to you. Salvation is not free. Salvation cost God all that he had. Your salvation cost God sending his one and only son to the cross to die a criminal's death. It cost God everything. That's how valuable you are to the Lord. That Jesus would die on the cross, rise from the dead, go through everything that he did so you could have a relationship with God. That's how much you value to God. That's how much you matter to God. But in the same way that we were not free for the Lord, a relationship with God isn't really free either. I want you to think about even just our human relationships, like your husband or your wife or even a close friend. Now, obviously, we don't look at it in the terms of, of buying something or paying for a relationship. But if you really care about something, you're going to be willing to pay, a, to pay a price for that. I remember when I, was, when I wanted to propose to my wife, I spent a lot of money on a ring. I spent a lot of money on a wedding. Now, did I sit there with my calculator and my spreadsheet and be like, is this a good investment? No. I don't even, who cares? Right? I love the girl. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend all, everything I can afford and then some. Because I want I, I to wanna, I wanna please her. I want to bless her because I, because I love this person. And it's the same way with God. There's times where, where we're going to have to count the costs and we're going to have to, we're going to, we're going to realize that, that we're giving things up in our life so that we can be close to him. Just like Pastor Shannon was saying tonight, that we're making room for him. We're going to do that in our life. You know what, what causes a lot of marriages to fail? It's when someone starts taking their spouse for granted. You know, that spouse is always there. They're never going to go anywhere. No matter what happens, they're, they're just there. Little does that person know that the reason they're there is because they love them and because they're committed to them. But it can be easy when something is static, when something doesn't change, to take it for granted and just think, oh, it'll just always be there. If, if it's possible to do that with, with a spouse, if it's possible to do that with a close friend, take a meaningful relationship for granted and forget the value. How possible do you think it is to do that with the Lord? You know, Christ is the closest friend that we'll ever have. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is always there. You know, David even, even says in the Psalms, like, God, if I climb the highest mountain, you're there. If I descend to the depths of, depths of the earth, you're there. He's always there. When we sin, he forgives us. When we repent. However, how many of you know that just because God forgave you for something yesterday does not mean that you should intend to do the exact same thing tomorrow just because he'll forgive you again? It doesn't mean that we should take that relationship for granted. Just because he's going to love you whether or not you pray, and just because he's going to love you whether or not you read your Bible, doesn't mean that, we, that it lets us off the hook and we don't do those things. If anything, it should make us want to do those things even more. If anything, because his love for us is, is, is steadfast and we're secure in him, it should make us desire him even more it should make us want to spend even more time with him it should make us realize the value of that relationship even more however that there there is a danger when we when something is unchanging when some when something or someone is so faithful towards us to slowly begin to take that relationship for granted slowly begin to take that person for granted and god forbid that we do that with him God forbid that we take our relationship with him for granted. You know what a relationship with the Lord costs? It costs your heart. It costs all of you. There's a, there's a parable in the Gospels. It's, it's known as the, the parable of the pearl of great price. Where this merchant, he finds a, a costly pearl. It costs everything that he owns. But he desires it so much that he sells everything that he has just so that he can afford 
that one pearl? Does he go home and does he, does he think about everything he's giving up? Does he, does he think about it in terms of sacrifice? No. He thinks of it as ter- in terms of purchasing something of far greater value. And you know, what this looks, on the out, looks like on the outward is going to be different from every, for every person. You look at the story of the rich young ruler where Jesus told him, go home, sell everything you possess, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. Jesus didn't say that to everybody. But he said it to that one person. Why? Because for that one individual, his wealth was the thing saying between him and God. His wealth had a hold of his heart. And Jesus knew that to get his heart, he had to get it through his wealth. But I don't believe that Jesus wanted his wealth in the first place. I think what he wanted was his heart. Look at the story of Abraham where God tells him, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham brings Isaac and he lays him on the altar. He's about ready to sacrifice him and God says, stop. Don't do it. Why? Because God didn't want Isaac. God wanted Abraham's heart. Same way with us. God wants all of us. And what it, what it costs to have all of him is everything that we are. To surrender it to him and to buy from him gold refined in the fire. The next thing that it says is, is white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Now, now, white obviously speaks of purity. White speaks of being washed by the blood of the Lamb. But there's something also that's significant that, that John might have had in mind when he wrote this. Another thing that the city of Laodicea was known for is, is the, the production of raven black wool. There were sheep covering the pastures, producing black wool. One of the things that this place was known for producing black cloth. It's interesting how Jesus tells him to buy white robes in stark contrast to everyone else. Now, what, what, can, we, what can we draw from this? Now, I, I'm, I'm not someone that believes that as a Christian you should be weird, that you should be odd, that people should look at you and oh, that person's a Christian. Right? That's, I don't think that's what God had in mind when he told us to be a peculiar people. But he does want us to be set apart. Now, even though we want to do everything that we can to be culturally and generationally relevant and, and, and be, become all things to all men, there are going to be things that the world does and the world is completely fine with that as a Christian you just don't do. There are going to be stances on things that you have to take. Be like, no, I love the Lord. I'm not going to do that. And people are going to, are going to give you a hard time for it. They're going to be like, why, not, why aren't you going to go drink with this anymore? Why aren't you going to smoke? Why aren't you going to do this? Why aren't you going to do that? Well, it's because we're called to be set apart. We're called to be different. Even things that might not, not necessarily be sin. But it's not what he's called you to. He's called us to be set apart. There should be a difference between you and the world. When the church starts looking exactly like the world, we have a problem. When people can't tell the difference between an unbeliever and a believer, there is a problem there. And Jesus said that I counsel you to buy white robes. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Then he goes on to say, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The city had become famous for producing an ancient form of eye medication. It was like a powder that you could grind up and mix with, mix with a liquid and put it over your eyes. What good is it to see physically if you can't see spiritually? I want to ask you this. Are you God aware? Are you aware of God's presence? Are you, or are you more aware of the other things of life? Now once again, I'm not advocating that you become one of those people where there's like a demon hiding under every rock. You turn every conversation spiritual, right? (laughs) It's not what we're advocating. It's like, man, you see that cloud, like God's speaking to me. It's like, oh, great, good for you. Get away from me, you're weird. I don't really think that's what he's speaking about. However, let me ask you this. Are you money aware or are you God aware? Are you him or her aware or are you more God aware? Are you problem aware or are you God aware? God wants us to open our eyes spiritually. God wants us to be able to see. God wants us to be able to to see him. And I believe that by his spirit, 
he's able to open our spiritual eyes. I believe that God wants us to be able to see him. I believe that God wants to, through his anointing, to anoint our eyes in a spiritual sense. So that we're aware of him. You ever had, had, that, had an encounter where maybe you've been, been dull and haven't really been aware of the Lord and then you encounter his presence in a fresh way and all of a sudden you're God aware? You begin to see God almost in everything. And I'm just going to let you into a little secret. I've noticed in my own life that when I'm God aware, I'm aware of his presence first, I tend to enjoy everything else in life a whole lot better. But when I'm focused on the other things in life, even blessings that God's given me, but when I cease to be God aware, anxiety sets in, depression sets in, all these other things happen. But we need to have eyes that see. We need to see what God is doing in our life, see God's plan for us. The next thing that Jesus says is, many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Have you ever said this to your kids? This is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. When I, when I was a kid and my parents would say that to me, it made zero sense. I was like, well, then don't spank me, <laughs> right? I mean, duh, if it's going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me, then just let's save us both the pain and just, we can just skip this whole thing altogether. But now that I'm a parent, I understand it entirely. It makes perfect sense. You know what? And I'm dreading the day that I have to actually discipline my daughter. I'm believing it never happens. That's probably, I'm believing a fantasy. You know, none of us d like disciplining our kids. None of us want to do that. But we do it because we love them. We do it because we know that in order for them to become the men and women that they need to be, it's going to take some rebuke. It's going to take some, as the Bible, chastening. The Bible says chastening. God even says in his word that whoever is not chastened is an illegitimate child. Meaning that if God's not convicting you, if God's not quickening things to you, if God's not saying, why did you do this? Why did you do that? You know, do better in this area. Not that God nags us, but how many of you know what, what it's like when the Holy Spirit convicts you? When you're trying to get away with something, but he's like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Like, no, leave me alone. You know? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And if you ever arrive at that place where God ceases to do that to you, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing when he's, if, if the Holy Spirit ceases rebuking and chastening you and quickening you to, to come up to another level in him, to lay down old habits, to lay down things. He says that as many as I love, I chase and therefore be zealous and repent. Zeal is the exact opposite of being lukewarm. He's saying, I want you to repent. I want you to be zealous for me. You know, when God speaks to you, how quick are we to repent? How quick are we to change? I want to give you a word of encouragement. Be a good repenter. Be good at changing. You know why? Because God's always going to be convicting you of things. God's always going to be challenging you to, to do better and to, and to come up to that next level. So be, be, be good at it. Be a good repenter. Be quick to listen. Be teachable. Amen. The next thing that Jesus says is, and this is my favorite part, and in fact, it's what drew me this entire passage. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Isn't it amazing that right after this stern rebuke comes one of the the greatest calls to intimacy in the entire Bible. Right after Jesus gets done rebuking this church for being lukewarm, he says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. You know, we love to use this verse on non-believers. You know, we'll tell them the Romans road, you know, God's... You know, God so loved the world, that's actually John 3, 16. But we'll tell them, you know, the way to sin is death. You know, we'll give them all these verses and we love to cap it off with, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing at the door of your heart waiting to come in. Now, I believe that is an appropriate application of this verse. However, this verse was written to Christians. This verse wasn't written to unbelievers. And I believe that just like in that day, I believe that Jesus is standing at the door of our heart and he's knocking. He's saying, would you let me in? Would you let me in so that I can dine with you, so that I can fellowship with you? 
How many of you know that if your house isn't in tip-top shape, it can be a little, it can be a little uncomfortable to let people into your house? You know, it can, it can be something that you don't really want to do if, 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 you know, everything isn't all spruced up and clean and feel like it's not a good representation of who you are. It can be kind of a little, a little unnerving to say, oh yeah, come on in. Or maybe we know that our living room's clean, but we want to let them into the bedroom. Or definitely not in the closet. Hopefully they don't have to use the bathroom while they're there, right? We, we just, we want to keep them limited to a specific place. I think so many times we're like that with the Lord. We're like, God, okay, come into the entryway. Let's hang out. Or God, you can come into my living room. Wait, where are you going? Don't go in there. You know, we want, we want to keep God in, within the, the confines of our comfortability. We don't want him going every which way inside of our proverbial home. Where we need to surrender everything to him. We need to let him in every nook and cranny of our heart. We let him shine his light in every, every space of possible darkness that there might be. We need to let him in. And the last thing is this, which, which I think is incredible. Is he says, let me in that I might eat with you and you with me. Now, today, we don't really put the same emphasis on, on eating as, as they used to. You know, there's, there's entire industries with, with, the, with the focus and the, and the goal of, of eating quickly and eating on the go, right? You know, we can just go grab a burger so quickly and, and just, just eat it while we're driving. You know, my ideal breakfast is something that I can eat on the way to work. But back in the time when this was written, almost even a generation ago, mealtime was something extremely important where you'd sit around the table and you'd fellowship and you'd share your heart. In fact, the Apostle Paul even said that you shouldn't even eat with somebody that claims to be a believer but is living in sin. Why? Because when you eat with somebody, you share your soul. And who, John, writing this, this book, who Jesus used to communicate this to the church of Laodicea, knew what it was like to eat with Jesus. You look at the Last Supper, the Bible says that he was reclined on Jesus' side. I mean, that's kind of imagery that nowadays, that'd be a little, that'd be a little strange. But back within that cultural context, he just wanted to be as close to Jesus as he possibly could. He just wanted to, to fellowship with him, be close to him, and dine with him. And Jesus is saying, would you, would you let me in that I might have that relationship with you, that I might have that intimacy with you? Finally, Jesus says this, and I want to close with this if the, the band, the worship team could come back up. It says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What an invitation to sit with Christ at his throne. That speaks of intimacy and authority. The Bible calls us joint heirs with Christ, sons of God, daughters of God, if you're, if you're a girl. We're, we're his children. But not in a general sense is where the whole world is, you know, God's children, God's offspring. It's, it's in a personal sense. It's in an authoritative sense where a son was someone that would inherit from the father, would inherit the name, would inherit the, the blessing and the possessions of the father. It's in a direct sense where he's called us to, to sit with him on his throne if we overcome. Now, this charge that Jesus gave to the church was not easy. To, to give up things in their life so that they could be closer to Him. To, to, to give up those things that might be standing in the way of intimacy with the Lord or, or standing in the way of being as, in, as close to Him as they possibly could. To let go of those things in their life. To, 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 to go all in completely. To be different than the, than the world surrounding them. It was not an easy charge. But Jesus said to him who overcomes, you'll sit with me. You'll be with me. You know, we live in a day and age where if something's not easy, we think something's wrong. We think that if something doesn't just fall into our lap, that it must not be the right thing for us. We think that if we actually have to work hard for something, that we should just find what we need elsewhere. But Jesus is saying, I've called you to overcome. I've called you to, to press through those things in your life. 
Maybe it's a temptation. Maybe it's a sin that, that's separating you from deeper intimacy with the Lord. God's calling you to overcome. God's calling you to overcome that temptation. God's calling you to overcome that lust or that greed or even just that distraction that's in the way. This is to him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. There is so much that God has for us, church. There's so much that he has in store. And the things of the world, as enticing as they seem to be, fail by far in comparison to everything that he has for us. I want to read this verse as I close. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. You can almost say this, that where the church of Laodicea got it wrong, Paul got it right. And I want to read this verse to you. It says, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Where things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the, right, to the resurrection from the dead. Now hear this, now that I've already attained, I'm already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold on that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to the things that are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Keep in mind who wrote this, this is the Apostle Paul. By the time he wrote this, this letter, he'd already written most of the New Testament. He already preached the gospel in countless cities and built churches and raised up pastors. This man probably did more for God than any other human being that ever lived. And he gets to this point in his life, he says, I'm not there yet. There's still more of God that I want. I still need to sell out more to the Lord. And I want to submit to you that if the Apostle Paul wasn't there yet, if the Apostle Paul could go to a place of deeper intimacy with the Lord, of greater fruitfulness for God, if he was willing to forget the former things and press on to what lay ahead, how much more can we come to a place where we say, God, I want more of you. God, I'm not satisfied with where I'm at right now. God, I'm not satisfied with the relationship with you that I have. God, I, I want you to use me more. God, I want to be closer to you. God, I want to know you. God, I want to be more intimate with you. I want to spend more time with you. I want to let you in every corner of my heart.